Well, good morning. Welcome to the service at Tabernacle. If you would take that mission book, please. Number 32, we've been starting each service with this course, Nothing is Impossible When You Put Your Trust in God. We'll sing that course out of that yellow book, and then we'll take the living hymnal and sing another song. If you would stand, please. The yellow book, page number 32, Nothing is Impossible When You Put Your Trust in God. You have that page number? Everyone, let's sing it together. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you trust in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God. 
sing it through twice. Let's do it again. Lift it up on stanza one together. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you trust in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word. For everything, oh everything, yes everything is possible with God. And thank you. Take that living hymnal please. 630. Hymn 630, sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. 630, we'll sing all three stanzas of this good song. You have the page number, let's sing it together. Sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Thank you, congregation. You may be seated. Choir remains standing. We'll sing in the mission book, number five. Here's the song that uh, in the tune of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, but Dr. Truax repinned the words, and we're singing his words to the tune, okay? So mission book number five, till every tribe shall hear. And you pray now for the choir. Choir practice this afternoon at five o'clock. Keep that in mind. If you sing in the choir or if you're out in the audience singing in the choir, you'll be here at 5 o'clock. We'll run over some songs for this week. God bless you.
like that version a whole lot better than the one in the book. Amen. Brother Truax improved on that. Can't improve on the King James Bible, but he did improve on that song right there. Amen. Amen. Good to see you. Man, we have people in church today. Churches all over the city canceling uh, their services. And I'm glad that you went ahead and, and uh, made it your uh, place to be here. Appreciate that. Good to have uh, my brother-in-law and his wife here. And glad he's not out on a ship somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean having to fight Florence off right now. Amen. But uh, glad that you're here this morning. How many of you are glad you're here this morning? How many are glad that you had power at your house? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah, it's a blessing. Um, uh, men, you go ahead and come. And as they're coming this morning, I uh, just want to make mention on the table to my left, there's a box that has gift cards in it that we're going to give to missionaries, wives. If you'd like to contribute to that, put a gift card in there. It doesn't matter the amount. Um, but if you put that in that box, we'll make sure that they get that. There's also, there's only two missionary families left that we don't have um, uh, really any place to stay right now. They, we have a place for them at Zion Hill, but there's two, only two that we have left if you want to open your home. And I can encourage you to do that. Opening your home to a missionary is definitely a blessing. It would be more of a blessing, I promise you, anything else. You won't have to take care of their dinner. You won't have to take care of uh, their lunch. We'll take care of all those things for them. Um, and uh, all you have to do is just give them a place to stay. And uh, you open your home, I promise you, you won't regret that. And then if you look, uh, if, if you have one, if you don't have one, I hope you get one in your hand. Um, our conference bulletin gives you a schedule of events in there. Wednesday, um, Thursday, and Friday, we have dinner for the missionaries that are going to be here with us. And uh, we'll provide that for them. And then there'll also be a lunch for them every day for the missionaries that are going to be with us. And then on Saturday, we're going to have an, an international meal for the church at 11 o'clock. And we want everybody to come for that. Everybody welcome to come for that. We're, we're going to provide the food. You don't have to bring anything. I was told that uh, if I didn't make that clear that somebody was going to bring balut. How many of you are, have never had balut? Would you raise your hand? How many would like to try balut? Would you raise your hand? <laughs> you should have prayed about that volunteering right there. I'd tell you that now. Balut is a 21 day old duck egg that has been pickled and say delicacy in the Philippines. They say that it's full of vitamins. Kind of reminds me when I was five and mom put the big spoon of English peas and okra on the plate. She said, it's good for you. Yeah, it's good for you. Taste, taste terrible. Amen. But, and then Sunday we'll have service. We will have a two, uh, we'll have a one o'clock service on Saturday. So we'll have service every uh, day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. A lot of missionaries are going to be here and uh, their names are right inside the bulletin where they're going to. We support almost half of them. So I want to encourage you to be here for that and uh, ask God just to help us. I've asked Brother Sam, uh, Todd, to come just say a word about how God has uh, helped him with giving to missions. You've heard a lot of people talk about their giving to missions. And uh, here in just a little bit, I'm going to try to get a card into all of our uh, people's hands about your faith promise giving. But I've asked Brother Sam just to come say a word about that. And Brother Todd, when you finish, if you just go ahead and ask God's blessing on the offering. Welcome back. Preacher always has a way of surprising people. Uh, I guess I would start... Uh, a lot of people know that I grew up in Africa and spent quite a few years there, probably around 16 or 17 years there. But uh, Faith Promise really didn't have an effect on me. I'd say, I would say till about 2006, a uh, missionary friend of mine, where well, he, he just helped with a lot of missionaries. He was kind of in my position. But uh, he called me and said he had a friend coming from Mexico, and he wanted me to send him some money to help him get from Mexico up here to, you know, Walterboro area, around Charleston, South Carolina. And, you know, to help him get there. And I says, well, that wasn't very a very smart missionary if he left one place and came to the other without enough money to get there. But he kept on calling me back, and I finally did that afternoon. Uh, the very next day at work, uh, working for myself, uh, this is back in 2006, I had more work than I could handle. And the Lord told me the next day, he says, whenever I ask you uh, to do something for a missionary or for missions or anything in that category, just to do what I ask you to do, and I would say uh, from that little testimony, not to take a lot of the time here, uh, I would like to encourage uh, anybody here to uh, just to pray and seek the Lord's will. If it's a little bit toward faith promise or what he would want you to do uh, for missions or faith promise or anything in that category, that the Lord will bless you and he will give you more than your 
heart has ever desired. He'll give you the house you've always wanted. He'll give you the car down to the color that you've always wanted as a child or a teenager or whatever. God will supply your needs, but he'll also give you your heart's desires. If you, uh, I would say if you first understand and uh, try to glean from, you know, faith, promise, or missions and just, you know, go that route. But uh, anyway, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you this morning for the service. Thank you. Uh, we have to be very grateful for the fact that we didn't have a big storm here or not yet and uh, that everything is intact, our house intact, the church is not leaking too bad. But uh, thank you this morning. Uh, be with the missions as uh, it comes up Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, help us all, even I, to glean something from the missionaries or the preachers that are coming in. Be with us this morning, Lord, in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Many years I longed for rest, perfect peace within my breast. And I often sought the Lord alone in tears, but I would not pay the price, would not make the sacrifice. So I wandered on and on for many years. Then one day while bowed in prayer, Jesus whispered to me there, take the cross and follow me to Calvary. Oh, how hard it was to die and of self to crucify just to lose my life and find it, Lord, in Thee. Let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in Thee. May all self be slain, my friends see only Thee. Though it cost me grief or pain, I will find my life again. If I lose my life, I'll find it, Lord, in Thee. Lord, I would not stand alone when I bow before Thy throne. Let me bring, dear Lord, at least one soul to thee here i give myself away take me use me lord i pray help me lose my life and find it lord in thee let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in Thee. May all self be slain, my friends see only Thee. Though it cost me grief and pain, I will find my life again. If I lose my life, I'll find it, Lord, in Thee. Let's sing again. 592. We'll stand, please. I love to tell the story. Will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. Then we'll let the choir go down. Then the pastor will be here with the message this morning. 532 is the page number. Are you there? Let's sing it together. I love to tell the story
number four. Stand in the choirs coming down to join you. Let's fellowship. Greet our guest this morning. God bless you. Okay, if you would stand again, please take the living hymnal, page 414, 414. We'll sing a couple stanzas, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. 414, everyone singing together on stanza one. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he shares. You may be seated before the pastor comes. Someone turned in a watch. Looks like maybe a lady's watch. 
And so if this is yours, you come claim it after the service. We'll be glad to get it back to you. God bless you. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Stevens. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I got to hear just a little bit of Brother Dan Eshelman this morning in the uh, uh, auditorium class. And he was talking about being the kind of husband that you ought to be. And I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain he and I have had a conversation already about how God has really helped him at least in the last year and a half. And, uh, you know, in being able to get things turned in a, in a better direction, not that they're necessarily bad, but in a better direction. And, uh, you know, I, I praise the Lord for somebody being honest about that. But I, you know what else I appreciate? I appreciate having a book that works. You know, there are a lot of people that have a theory about marriage. They have a theory about raising children. They have a theory about how they should run their finances, but the Bible gives you the answers for those things. And I don't know if you heard uh, what he had to say this morning, but I'd encourage you to, uh, to go ahead and get a copy of that if you could and listen to it. I want you to take your Bible this morning, go to Acts chapter 18, if you would. Acts chapter 18. And uh, we, have, we have guests that are here this morning, and um, I'm glad that they're here. We probably have several that are listening. Um, maybe around the state because of the outages as far as um, the churches that have canceled services. Hopefully some of them got power. If they have no power, we can't get to them with a live stream um, unless they've got their phones charged and we get to them through the WTBI app. And uh, amazing world that you can communicate with people on the other side of the world by using a little app on your phone. I thought phones were supposed to be for communicating with people. And, uh, you know, now you can, you can bank on your phone. You can do all kinds of things. And speaking of banking, if you are a member of Tabernacle Baptist Church or if you are a permanent guest, um, we're, we're glad you're here. I want you to get this in your hands today. And uh, our ushers are going to come by and they're going to put this in your hand. I want you to pray about your faith promise. Uh, we won't receive the faith promise offering until Sunday of this coming week. But uh, just you fellas, y'all just start passing them out from the back to the front, however you want to do it, right in the middle. And all of our members, I want you to get one of these and I want you to take and I want you to pray about what God would have you to give. My wife and I don't just sit down and say, okay, let's give this amount and look at our finances. We pray about what God would have us to give. And I, I don't want you to give a penny more than what God would have you to give. I want you to give exactly what God's put on your heart. Now, if you're a teenager, you're welcome to get one of those as well. But we want to get that to everybody. And, and really, the faith promise, uh, there are all sorts of numbers on the right-hand side. You can put down anything you need to write in that blank and uh, what you're going to give each week. And uh, some of you may give monthly. You can write that on there. But uh, I just we want you to pray about it. Pray about it during the conference. Uh, my brother is going to be here preaching on Wednesday through Saturday. And uh, he honestly is, uh, he is one of the best preachers on missions, one of the best preachers that I know anyway. And I'm excited if you get to hear him. I told you you could help me out that, that just a little bit. You can go to him and ask him how much older he is than I am. That would really play well in my family if you could do that. And uh, he's my younger brother. But uh, gave his life to the Lord when he was 15, never went out in the world, and God's just greatly helped him in his preaching, particularly in missions. He's been on the mission field, and now he's back pastoring, uh, where I was privileged to pastor for 22 years there in Alabama. But he'll be here Wednesday through Saturday, and I want to encourage you to come out and uh, help us consider eternity, and you pray about this. Now, whether or not you want to pray about it as a family, whether you want to pray about it individually, we try to encourage our children to give to missions. And um, I think it's a, a good investment. I don't think it's something that you're just giving to a plate. I think it's an investment. I think it's something you'll find in heaven. I keep hearing people talk about there's going to be a big correction in the stock market. Anybody heard that? Anybody heard that? Nobody's heard that. Okay. How many of you have no stocks and don't care about the stock market? Would you raise your hand? Okay. There you go. Um, those that have stocks in the stock market. I had a friend of mine talking to me last week and he said, there is a huge correction coming. And he gave the reason why a, a huge investor stockholder said that when these two variables come together, then there's always, always been a huge correction. And those variables came together this past May. And he said, I'm just holding on right now. I don't know when I'm going to get out. You know, you don't ever have to worry about that when you come to investing in missions. When you invest in missions, it never goes down. Stock always goes up. Amen. <laughs> Every, every day of your life goes up. If you're not part of giving the missions and you don't understand it, we have some young families here. If you don't understand it, come see me. 
Let me explain to you what uh, we believe about giving to missions. We support 283 missionaries. And that money comes from our people giving to missions. We don't give it to a cooperative program that takes and splits it up. We give it to the mission boards that they're out of or sometimes directly to the missionary. And that's done every month. All right. So we send that out every month. And uh, we couldn't support 283 if it weren't for all those that sacrificially give. I'm, I'm trusting the Lord. I'm going to say something this morning. I'd like to see Tabernacle Baptist Church give a million dollars to missions every year. Say, well, we need to go out and find us some wealthy people. You know, my experience is those that are wealthiest oftentimes give the least. It's just going to take everybody giving together. Some giving sacrificially, some giving supernaturally. I'd love to tell you a story about a man um, who could not get a job. And uh, I won't give any details. Couldn't get a job. Couldn't figure out how to do it. And uh, he had a record. And because of his record, it was keeping him from being able to find employment. But he believed in missions and he believed in the work of God. So he tried to give to missions and he started giving. And uh, anyway, he ended up uh, starting a business and a state contracted with him. He is one of the largest contractors now in the state. And the amount of money he gives to missions each month is just off the charts because God has just made him the sole proprietor of what the state wants done. And that's government money. And I say government money going to missions is a good thing. Amen. 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 It's a good thing. And it was just by him just trying to find God, what can I do? God's giving through him what he was never able to give to him. And I appreciate that. Acts chapter 18. Acts 18 this morning in your Bible. <clears throat> we looked last week at Gallio and uh, what happened when they took Paul to the judgment seat and they wanted to really get rid of Paul. And uh, then we saw Gallio, he refused to listen. And then he rebuked them for their accusation. Then he removed them. And then he beat Sosthenes right in front of them. We saw Sosthenes a little bit later on, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as a brother in Christ, along with Crispus, both chief rulers of the synagogue. So there's some really big uh, things going on here in Acts chapter 18 at Corinth. Now, if you look down at verse 18, and I really struggle with what to preach from this passage, but I really believe this is what God had me preach. Verse 18 says, And Paul, after this tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea he had, and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. I want to preach this morning about the heart of what I believe to be the greatest missionary in the Bible. And I want to look at his heart this morning for just a little bit, especially our hearts going into a missions conference and considering what we're going to do for a year for the cause of the gospel in Christ. Would you pray with me? Ask God to help me this morning. Lord, I ask you to help me this morning. Those that are listening today, I pray you'd help us to give them good instruction from the Bible for your people seated here this morning. I pray God they'd feel the presence of your spirit and Lord that you would help us as we look into the Bible today and not look at it as a book written by men, but look at it as a book written by your hand that has something in it that could help our lives and help our heart. Lord, you said the heart was deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And God, we want our heart to be made like unto yours. We want a new heart. Lord, we want our heart to be bent toward the things that you love and away from the things of the world. I pray you'd help me to make it clear this morning through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I think most of us would agree that Paul loved the church. Could you say amen to that? Amen. Paul loved the church. Jesus loved the church. That's stated in Ephesians chapter 5. But Paul loved the church. And the reason you could tell how much he loved the church is by what he does for the church. If you look there in verse number 18, the Bible says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. I, I really think that Paul wanted to settle those Corinthians. 
Because if you go right back up above it, you have Sosthenes being beaten. You have all these Jews that are upset and causing an insurrection. And I think he just wants them to be settled. He's going to spend the time there, which is time. After this, tarried there yet a good while. He's going to take the time to try to comfort their heart, to try to calm them down, to try to get them to know, hey, look, everything's going to be good. Everything's going to be all right. And, and I appreciate people that have that ability that they take time with others. Sometimes it might be when a, a spouse dies. Sometimes it might be when there's bad news given to a family. And there'll be somebody that'll come alongside and they don't have any answers, but they'll take the time to spend with somebody and by their presence, just say, hey, listen, I'm here for you. We're going to work through this thing and just to kind of settle them. Paul could have just left, but he didn't. He tarried for a while. He took something very valuable, his time, and he spent it with these Corinthian believers and he wanted to settle them. And then notice not only that, but look what else he says in verse number um, 22, the Bible says this. And when he had landed at Caesarea, I mean, he's going to the church of Ephesus, he's going to Antioch, he goes to Galatia, verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. He didn't have to. He went in and saluted the church. Hey, I'm here, guys. Just want you to know, glad to hear y'all still doing the same thing. He's just, again, he's trying to settle them. Next verse, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, again, he's spending time, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. All right, so he's going in now. He's trying to strengthen them. He's trying to take truth, and he's trying to put it into their heart to build them up and to strengthen them. They didn't have Google. They didn't have the internet. All right. They were more isolated than we've ever been. And when you go into a place and you give the gospel, people get saved. The opposition rises up. Paul wants to settle them. So he spends time doing that. And then he takes the time to strengthen them, to teach them the Bible. You know, Jesus told Peter that same thing. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. I want you to spend time, Peter, strengthening some other people. Listen, how many of you could say this? There's been somebody in your life that came alongside you and put strength in you when you needed it. Could you say amen to that? Amen. Maybe at a low time. Maybe they, taught you, maybe they taught you some principles from the Bible that you didn't understand. Maybe about finances. Maybe about marriage. I remember years ago, a man came to my office and he hadn't been saved very long. He or his wife, neither one. And he came to me and he said, preacher. You talked about husbands loving their wives. I don't know how to do that. Would you teach me how to do that? Now, he wasn't talking about in the worldly sense. He's talking about from the Bible. How do I love my wife? What do I do? And so I told him, I said, you give her $100 every now and then. I told him to give her flowers from time to time. I told him to date her. I told him to take her out to eat. I just told her, look, just love her. Give yourself to her. And I told you, you don't have to have some manual. But then we sat down with the Bible and we looked at some things about Jesus loving the church in Ephesians chapter 5. And I tried to pass those along to him. And what I'm saying is Paul is not just saying, okay, glad we got a church started in Galatia. Do the best you can. No, he takes his time and he sits down and he teaches in Galatia. He teaches in Phrygia. He teaches in Antioch. He teaches in Caesarea. He teaches in Ephesus. He teaches at Corinth. He's trying to strengthen the brethren. All right. And the reason I think he's doing that and taking the time is because he loves the church. When you start spending your time on someone or on something, your heart is going to be bent that direction. The Bible says where a man's treasure is, there will his heart be also. I love Tabernacle Baptist Church. How about you? Amen. Somebody's going to say this week, why? My goodness, we come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. Why do we need to come Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? I'll tell you why. Because we love the church. Amen. I like to be here. I enjoy being here. I'm here during the week, during the day. Sometimes coming here when nobody else is in here. Walk around inside, talk to Jesus. Get up here and pray in the pulpit. Walk around and pray over the pew that you're seated in. I enjoy being in the church. I like this place. I love this place. And I'm going to tell you one of the reasons why is because the church has done a lot for me. I got my wife at the church. I didn't get my wife through the internet. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that. But I tell you what, I would pick the church 10 times over than the internet. Amen. All right. 
I got my training at the church. The best friends that I have in life, I got at the church. I was saved as a result of a Bible-believing preacher preaching that Jesus saved sinners from their sin. I love the church for more than just one reason. It's not just cultural. And Paul gave his heart to it, so he spent his time there. It's been years ago I had somebody say, Preacher, we spend too much time at church. I think people spend too much time at the Little League ballpark. They spend too much time at Walmart. They spend too much time online. What do you love? Paul loves the church. So instead of doing something else, he's traveling, which is expensive and not comfortable. And he's going from place to place and he's taking and he is giving them something to build them up, to edify them, to strengthen them. That's what the Holy Ghost said. The Holy Ghost in John 16 is described as one that would guide the believer into all truth. I think a Bible-believing church should be guiding its people into all truth. Amen. Amen. And so Paul's saying, look, I'm going to spend time. So he's trying to strengthen the church, settle the church. Let me give you a verse to write out beside that. It's in 1 Peter. I think it's a great verse and sometimes applies to our lives when things are not going the way we want them to go. 1 Peter chapter 5, let me read verse 10 to you. The Bible says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. All right, I think that's a great verse that's a companion of what Paul's trying to do. Strengthening, establishing, settling. He could say, I hope they do well, but that's not what his heart is. I want to see them do well. So he's, his heart for the church is something that is of note in the passage. And then I noticed another thing that, that really, uh, really stood out to me in Acts chapter 18. And it's, it's a little bit strange if you look what he says in verse 21. All right. The people at Ephesus want him to stay to tarry with them. Verse 21, he tells them no, but bade them farewell saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. He says, you know what? I've got to keep this feast in Jerusalem. I've got to get to Jerusalem. That's where my heart is. I, I, I love the church. I love you. But I also, I love, I love the Jewish people. I've got a heart for the lost as well. And he's thinking about Jerusalem, and it's not hard to find what kind of heart he had for his own people. If you're in Acts, turn to Romans chapter 9 just a minute. And, and really, when I read this, and as I read it this morning, it convicted me, it bothered me, because my heart is not like this. I wish that it were. I, I, I want God to work my heart to be like this. In Romans chapter 9, Paul speaking about the, the Israelites, the Bible says in verse number 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. You understand what he's saying? I'd be glad if God just cursed me and saved my kinsmen. Now, I don't know if he's thinking about people in his direct family his mother and father, who definitely would have been Pharisees and would have been opposed to what he was doing with the gospel of Christ. I don't know if he's thinking about the Jewish nation as a whole. I don't know if he's thinking about the tribe of Benjamin because that's where he's from. All I know is that he says in verse number two that he has continual sorrow in his heart. His heart's always heavy. He's got a heavy heart. I remember uh, years ago we had a, a gentleman that had led uh, several Roman Catholic uh, people to Christ in the same family. And one of them ended up being a missionary out of our church. And so I asked this man to come and uh, speak at a, a men's breakfast. And he did, but when he did, he had tears in his eyes talking about these guys that he'd led to Christ. So I asked him to come back to our Sunday school assembly, much like we have. And I asked him, would you say something to our people? And he got up and this is, and this is an older gentleman, his name was Mel Pratt. And he got up and he said, he said, well, it's good to be here today. And and then he stopped and he started, he started getting a little bit broken in his voice and started quivering with his lips. And he said, uh, souls are so precious to Jesus Christ. Amen. And that man for just a couple of minutes just talked about how valuable those souls were and how privileged he was to get to see those men trust Christ. He had a, a burden that was inside of him. It wasn't something that he had to work up outwardly. 
It was something on the inside. And Paul says here in chapter 9, he says, I've got that in my heart. And the reason I have that is because my brethren, according to the flesh, are lost. Some of you have a lost brother. Some of you have a lost mother. I'm sure that weighs heavy on the heart. Look at chapter 10. Paul says the same thing here. Chapter 10, verse number 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So I've got a burden for my people. I've got, a, I've got a desire to see them saved. He's got a heart for people that are lost, even people that have been very confrontational to him, that have opposed him, that have hurt him, that have blasphemed him, that have falsely accused him. Paul has this heart for people. He's got a heart for the church, but he's got a heart for the lost, particularly his people. Go back to Acts chapter 18. I'll show you another unique thing about that. In Acts chapter 18, and, and again, reading it, just reading through it, it it almost doesn't seem to fit in the passage, but it does. This is the second missionary journey of Paul, and and here he is, he's going out and he's visiting these churches, and he loves them, he wants them to be settled and strengthened. Verse 18 again, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. Everything's good to that point. Next phrase, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. That's unusual. He shaved his head because he had a vow. That's just put in the passage. And I think that you can't separate that statement from the statement in verse 21 about, I've got to be at this feast in Jerusalem. And I think that what Paul is doing is he's thinking about Crispus and his family, a ruler of the synagogue. Sosthenes, a ruler of the synagogue, both men saved, Crispus' family saved. And he starts thinking about all those people back in Jerusalem that are lost, and I've got to get back there. I've got my heart is pushing me that direction. I love the church, but I love these lost people. I can't get out of my mind. And to such the point that he's willing, verse number 18, to shave his head and to make a vow to try to reach them. Amen. You say, what's the big deal? How many of you would like to shave your head to try to reach somebody for Christ? Would you be willing to do that? (laughs) Some some of you I'm looking at, you wouldn't have very far to go, would you? Amen? (laughs) It'd be easy for you, right? (laughs) You know, young men are particular about their hair. Sometimes I wonder, it looks like they were dipped in sticky glue and put a vacuum cleaner on top of their head and it just kind of swirls a different direction and that's the style. I don't know how, how you style something like that, but they're particular. Girls are particular about their hair, women particular about their hair. Three times in the Bible it talks about a woman being shorn. All right. Paul shaved his head here. Talks about a woman being shorn. Talks about it in Deuteronomy when it, when it comes to her being a prisoner of war. Talks about it in Numbers chapter 5 when it talks about the jealousy between her husband and making accusation, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's just a very strange thing to have somebody shaved like that. Paul Paul shaves his head. He takes it, he shaves his head. And the Bible says the reason he does is because he had a vow, verse number 18. He made a vow. He makes a sacrifice. He cuts off his hair. He cuts off his hair because of what's going on in his heart. And then he turns around and he makes a vow. He makes a promise to God. That's what a vow is. He's just making God a promise. Now, that's pretty much what we have right here. They're just making a promise to God. God, by faith, I'm going to do something over the next year. I'm going to make you a promise. And that's what he does. He makes a vow to God. Now, in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, a vow, a vow sometimes was something that was part of the Jews' sacrificial system. They would bring, you know, something in sacrifice and, and confirm a vow that they'd made to God. And sometimes it was about devotion. They say, look, I love you, Lord, so I'm going to give this land. Barnabas sold the land that he had, took and brought the money and set it at the apostles' feet. Sometimes it was about giving one of their children. That's a famous vow in the Bible, Hannah. Hannah made a vow to God. That's what she did. She said, God, if you'll give me a child, if you'll do this for me, then I will give him back to you all the days of his life. And that's exactly what she did. She took Samuel to Eli, a man who was not a godly man, and gave him her son, Samuel, because of a vow she made. There are a lot of vows in the Bible. There's a vow in Judges chapter 11, Jephthah. Jephthah says, God, if you'll give me a victory, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house. Terrible vow that he made. 
but the Bible says that he kept it. Jacob made the first vow you find in the Bible in Genesis chapter 28, and he's asking God to bless him. In fact, put a little mark right there in Acts 18 and go, if you would, to Genesis 28, just so you can see that for a moment. Genesis 28. Would you turn there? Are you turning in your Bible? Are you looking? Are you looking? Genesis chapter 28. Jacob. Jacob wants God's blessings. Jacob is going to see uh, Esau, and he definitely doesn't want to do that because he knows Esau wants to kill him. And uh, so Jacob, he, uh, he's preparing to do so. And in Genesis chapter 28, look down if you would at verse number 20. The Bible says, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then... So here's what he's saying. God, God, I want you to be with me. God, I want you to keep me in the way I'm going. God, I want you to give me food and raiment, which the Bible says are necessities of life. First Timothy chapter six. And he says, and if you'll bring me back home to my father's house, if you'll do those things, I'm going to make a vow to you. All right, look what he says. Verse 21. Then shall the Lord be my God, number one. Number two, this stone which I've set for a pillar shall be God's house. Number three, and all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee or give the tenth unto thee. So that's what his vow was. God, if you'll do those things to me, then here's what I'm going to do for you. You're going to be my God, and I'm going to make this pillar your house, Bethel, and I'm going to give you a tenth. If you'll be my God. Now, God in Genesis 31 reminds him of that. He remembered the vow. Let me ask you a question. Now, don't answer it out loud. Have you ever made a vow to God? You ever made a promise? I'm not talking about faith promise. I'm talking about have you ever made a promise to God? People do that all the time. And really, they get into a spot. Isn't it amazing how that we're against prayer in school and we're against the Bible in school, but when we were going to go to war with Iraq and Desert Storm, we got little yellow ribbons tied on everything and stuck on the back of people's cars saying, please pray for our troops. When it came time to fight and be in harm's way, then we believed it was time to pray. And all I'm just saying is this. Listen, there are a lot of people who make vows in their lifetime. You know, the Bible says the mariners made a vow to God. They're trying to make a vow to God. They're trying to get Jonah to the shore. They're lost. They're trying to get Jonah to the shore. He's a, he's a, a backslidden prophet. And they're making a vow. God, they're making a vow. They're talking to God, giving him a promise. And then Jonah makes a vow. In Jonah chapter 2 and verse number 9, three days in a whale's belly. How many of you think it'd be time to talk to God three days in a whale's belly? God's talking to Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, and Jonah's saying, I'm not listening. Jonah goes and gets in a ship going down to Joppa. I don't want to hear what you got to say, God. I am not listening. God says, okay, you're going to ride in a whale's belly for three days. And then Jonah cries out to God, then, oh, God. You know, I'd say it'd be better to listen to God outside the whale's belly than inside the whale's belly. Amen. But he made a vow. Jonah 2.9 says that Jonah made a vow. You know what I think he vowed? God, if you'll get me out of this whale's belly, I promise. I will go to Nineveh and I will say what you wanted me to say. Even though I don't like those people, even though I hope those people die, I will go say what you want me to say. He made an agreement with God and he kept his bargain. Amen. He said, God, if you'll do this, I will do this. And he kept his vow. Hannah. God, if you'll give me a child, provoked by our adversary, couldn't have a child. If you'll give me a child, God, I'll give him back to you. Let him serve you all the days of his life. And she kept her vow. Jephthah, awful vow in Judges 11. The Bible says, and he kept his vow. And what I'm saying is a vow, a promise being made to God. You and I, we ought to be careful about just saying, well, you know, I'm just, uh, just going to make a promise to God and then forget about it. God, if you'll give me a job, I promise I'll start giving more money. God, if you'll give me a wife, I'll do this. God, if you'll do this for me, then I'll start going to church and I'll start doing this. I think you ought to keep your vows to God. Amen. Ecclesiastes 5 says that very thing. We don't have time to look at all the verses today, but Ecclesiastes 5 says that when you make a vow to God, pay that which thou hast vowed. When you make a vow, pay it. Numbers 30, the whole chapter is about making vows and keeping them. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, how many of you expect people to keep their promises they make to you? Let me, let me ask you this question. How many of you, since it's 2018, 
need a lawyer and somebody to put a form out there and sign it in triplicate so they'll keep their promises made to you. People say all kinds of things don't keep their promises. All right, we don't enjoy that. Someone says, hey, I promise you, I'm going to give you tickets to this Clemson game. They, they tell you to get an excuse. They give you a reason why. And you say, boy, I just really love those people. Somebody says, I'm going to come by. I'm going to take care of I'm going to clean up your yard for you, cut your grass, do whatever. And, and they don't do it. Somebody says, listen, I tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to do that for you. And they don't do it. People that don't pay their vow, God listens to that. Six times in the book of Psalms, David says that he paid that he had vowed. Twice he said he performed the vow. All right. David kept, David made vows and kept them. And I know sometimes people say, well, preacher, I just, I just don't really think that, that, that I, I don't really believe in signing your name to anything. Well, you don't, you don't have to sign your name to this at all right here anywhere. You don't have to sign your name. Wouldn't that be a good way to take out a car loan? Yes. Amen. Come on, wouldn't you, wouldn't you be gladly go out and take a car loan and not have to sign your name? Because then you're not liable for it, right? Amen. It's, it's funny too now. People say this, preacher, I just don't believe in making a commitment. Oh, you, you don't have a house payment? You don't have a car payment? You don't have a cable bill payment and a cell phone payment. Y'all getting real quiet this morning. <laughs> I just don't believe in making vows, preacher. Sure we do. We make all kinds of promises about repaying all kinds of things. I think it's right to make a promise to God about getting the gospel around the world. Amen. I think you ought to pray about it. And, but I think what Paul did, he made a promise to the place that he sacrificed. You know, somebody had said it's a Nazarite vow. Couldn't be a Nazarite vow. Nazarite vow, you know, he's not going to have, he's going to let his hair grow out, not going to shave it off. So it's, it's not a Nazarite vow. Go back to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. I'll tell you what I think it is. And then, and, and that's really the heart of my message. He loves lost people so much. He's willing to make a vow. I'm going to take and make God a promise. All right. I love the church, but I love lost people so much. I'm going to make a vow to do something about it. Acts 18. All right, Acts 18, the Bible says there again, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow, verse 21, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Now there's a little bit of a reference to that over in chapter 21. Turn just a few pages to your right. Chapter 21, look what the Bible says. Paul ends up in Jerusalem. And when Paul gets in Jerusalem, They begin talking about how the Jewish people know that he is, that there's being said that he is an opponent to them. He's opposite them. Look at verse 18. The day following Paul went in with us into James and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. They said, Paul, there's a lot of people who think that you're opposed to Judaism. And look at the, look at the answer they give him, verse 23. Do, do therefore this we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them, then take and purify themselves with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. Now, I, I'm not saying this. He, he, may have, he may have decided being a Jew, if he shaved his head, that somehow that would appease the Jews, that that would somehow give him opportunity. And that's really what I think he's looking for. I think he wants an opportunity to witness to the Jews so badly he's willing to shave his head and to make a vow to God, God, I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to reach these people, whatever it takes. Because he's right back at the synagogue. He cares about them. And in Acts 21, he's, there's four men that have their heads shaved and he does the same thing. He's willing to give up his hair to reach somebody. Come on, I don't know. How, how much does hair sell for? I have no idea how much hair sells for. I mean, if you needed hair, I guess hair would sell for a lot if you could put it on. I do know this, hair transplants cost a lot of money. I don't have any idea what a wig costs. I don't have any idea what that costs. Um, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know what it costs. I, I've heard that people sell their hair over in China. They sell their hair. They put it on dolls that we have here. And so, you know, I don't know how much you get paid for that. How much would you get paid for cutting off your hair? All right, but I just know this. I would not be willing. There's a lot that I would not be willing to do to have my head shaved. If, if I got to shave my head to prove I'm a good pastor here, I'm keeping my hair. 
You say, well, you just don't love us. I'm trying. <laughs> but my wife's going to have to look at me every day. My children, I got one of my children, I'm going to tell you which one. One of my children, they like to picture me bald. I don't know if this is some premonition or what's going on. They'll take and they'll pull my hair back. <laughs> and they'll say, oh, you look funny. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is what they're going to be saying another four or five years from now. My wife's got to look at something. And I, look, I've, I've even decided I'm not going to do the wraparound thing like people in, you know, in politics do. I'm, I'm sh if, if, if I start losing, I'm shaving it. Y'all going to have a bald-headed preacher. How about that? First time since you ever started the church. How about that? And it won't be pretty. I mean, I got a head that looks like the lunar landscape, man. I got scars and stuff all over my head. I've been sewed up so many times. But Paul said, you know what? I shaved my head. That means the beard. All right. That means taking something off here. All right. He's given up some status there. He's taking off his hair. He says, I'm willing to sacrifice all of this to somehow try to reach them. I, I, think, I think you and I putting something in a plate is not nearly probably as important when we have most of us, we give out of what we have. There's no real sacrifice there. I think that's a pretty good sacrifice. And I think Paul, the reason he's doing that is because he wants to see them saved. Look at one other passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 9, and I'll be finished. So Paul, his heart, if you're looking at his heart, he really does love the Jews. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at it. He loves the Jews. He loves the church, but he loves these lost people to the point that he's willing to take, shave his head, and make a vow. And here's, here's the last verse I'll show you. I think he's doing it for the gospel's sake. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Look down, if you would, there at verse number, um, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet I, I have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Now, again, this is Corinthians. All right, that's where we are in Acts. To them that are without the law is without law, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake. That's what he said. I'm becoming all things to all men. Now, that doesn't mean that we sin. But becoming all things to all men. I believe it was William Carey. William Carey took and uh, grew his hair and pulled it like the, the Chinese people that he, he ministered to. Now that would not be received here, but it was received there. I know a man that took and moved on an island up to an area that was just really very poor. Really poor. Took his family and moved them in there. And when he did, the locals said, we cannot believe you moved in there. I mean, they had rats running around the house. I mean, it was, it was really, the roads were very, very poorly made. And when he moved his family up there, they said, we, we could not believe that you came here. And you know what? He got to see people saved. He got to see the church grow because they looked at him and said, look, he's living like one of us. How hard it must it be for an American to live like we're living to reach us? They respected that. And I'm just saying, Paul, Paul is taking, he's shaving his head. He's making a vow. God, I promise to do this. I sure would love to see my brethren saved. Amen. He's making a vow and he's sacrificing because he's got a heart for the lost. Now, I look at my heart and I don't know that I have that kind of heart. I want that kind of heart. I want the heart like Mel Pratt had that would get up and just with tears say, oh, the, the value of a soul is just so precious. I want that heart. I don't want to just be able to check off, okay, I made visitation at 10. Okay, I, I, made, I made visitation at 7. I, I talked to the people I was supposed to talk to. I've heard people making a vow they were going to witness somebody every day of the year. Amen. Every day. I've heard of people making vows they were going to get a certain number of tracks every day. We're going to talk about making a vow and promise God, I'm going to give a certain amount of money to missions every year. 
all, every month trying to get something done for you. And all I'm just saying is I want a heart like that. Loving the church, but loving lost people. That's what Paul shows us today. Would you stand to your feet? And I'm just going to ask you, I wonder how many of you'd like a heart like that. If you'd like a heart like that as the piano plays and the organ plays, I'm just going to encourage you. Won't you come to an altar and just ask God, God, help me to have a heart like that. Whatever it takes, whatever you need to work in my life, Lord, whatever truth I need to understand, would you please help me see people like that where I'd have that kind of heart? Would you come this morning? Heart of a great missionary. Love the church. Oh, but he loved lost people to where he'd, he'd be willing to sacrifice his hair and sacrifice a vow to God and say, God, I'm going to do this, try to reach the world. Would you come this morning? God, would you give me that kind of heart? 